We're not at that day. I, maybe we are. Maybe it'll happen today. I, I hope I don't have lunch today. <laughs> I'd, I'd love for the Lord to take us, take us home to heaven right now. But uh, we're, we're living in another day. And uh, I want you to turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3. I want to talk to you about end times. And we don't know when Jesus might come. It could be today. Maybe, maybe it'll be tomorrow. Maybe it'll be 10 years. I, I don't know. Maybe it'll be 100 years. But uh, I believe we're in the last days. End times living. And uh, Jesus said, and we're going to look at this in a, in a moment, that the last days would be like the days of Noah. And man, it was rough in the days of Noah. And uh, there's some things going on that, uh, you know, you and I probably never thought we'd see in our lifetime. Uh, you, you know, it's just amazing some of the, the strange things that are going on. Uh, people deciding that they're not a man, they're a woman, or they're not a woman, they're a man, or, uh, you know, what next? When, uh, when uh, homosexual marriage was approved here in Australia, I sent my marriage stuff into the government. I said, I'm not, I'm not doing marriages that you recognize because you do not recognize marriage. And I've, I've not told you that. I've, I've realized I should, I should let you know. <laughs> uh, I'm, I would be happy to do a church wedding, but uh, we're not going to do a government wedding because they, they've ruined it. And uh, I don't believe God necessarily needs their authority for, for a person to be married. Uh, we're living in the end times. These, these are some tough times. And I'm going to read you some, uh, some hard verses this morning, some difficult ones. But uh, I think it'll be a blessing because as we get through those, uh, the Lord gives us some light and an encouragement at the end. Let me start by reading the first verse of 2 Timothy 3. This know also that in the last days, perilous times shall come. Perilous times shall come. Now that... Th those words, perilous times, in Matthew 8, 28, are translated exceeding fierce. You, you probably know the account where Jesus is uh, in Gad... Gad what's the name of the place? Gad... Gadara. Uh, I was going to say Gadarenes, that's the people. Uh, he was in Gadara, and there was two demon-possessed men, and the Bible says they were exceeding fierce. Same words. That's the kind of day we're living in. And listen, you see that in in the news, don't you? Uh, when somebody steps out of line by their way of thinking, boy, they're exceeding fierce. Uh, the, the thing that brought this up in my mind was this thing with uh, the rugby player Israel Folau, uh, just quoting scripture, basically, putting Galatians uh, 5, verses 19 through 21, which, by the way, not very long ago, I just preached on. Uh, how, and, and God says that people that do those uh, are not a part of the kingdom of God. It was a very simple, simple statement. And the world, man, it, it jumped up and turned left. I mean, uh, how wicked of him to say that. He should repent of saying that. But boy, don't they, don't they get uh, religious, you know, but in the wrong way. And uh, it just reminds us we're living in troubled times. We're living in times where, you know, we used to laugh and say, he doesn't know whether he's Arthur or Martha. Now people are living that. Yeah, it's no joke anymore. Uh, Things are going on that just don't make any sense. And, and the world is just foolish enough to believe it. Perilous times. At that point, he said, shall come. That's been a couple thousand years ago. I think we're just about there. I don't know. But he gives us some of the characteristics here. And we're just going to work our way through it. You're my class this morning, all right? You don't have to take notes. God's, God's written it down for us. But uh, there's, there's a bunch of things here, at least 20 or so. And uh, let's start in verse 2. For men shall be lovers of their own selves. Number one. <laughs> uh, men shall be lovers of their own selves. The world even teaches that that's the right way to live. Self-esteem. You need to love yourself. God says no man ever yet hated himself. Uh, the, our problem is not that we don't love ourselves. Our problem is we love ourselves too much. If we didn't love ourselves, we wouldn't worry about how people treated us. <laughs> and then number two, he says, covetous. They're going to love money. Oh, we'd never do that. Boasters. The word boasters has to do with being empty pretenders. 
You know, that goes on all the time. People think that if they say it, it must be true. And just empty pretense. Then he says, proud. That's very, very similar. High opinion of self. Blasphemers. That has to do with uh, railing, hard words, abusive. You know, that's going on all the time where, where people are abusive in their language. Uh, we live in a day where people communicate more than ever and say less than ever. Uh, you know, people are communicating all the time and they're finding it a real problem. Uh, kids are having trouble, adults are having trouble with people abusing them uh, through electronic media. There's a simple solution, folks. <laughs> throw it in the ditch. Just throw it in the ditch. If your kids are having trouble with social media, uh, listen, take a hammer and smash that thing. It'll never speak to you again. <laughs> You'll be all right. Anyway, I, I don't want to get off on that. Railing, abusive. Then he says, disobedient to parents. Family breakdown. We're, we're living in a day where kids sue their parents for, for having them. <laughs> oh, that was, that was real abuse. Disobedient to parents. Unthankful. It just has to do with being ungrateful. Unholy. Uh, that's, that's being wicked. We live in a wicked world. I wanted to have you look at 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 9 and 10. The Bible has some real graphic verses. Uh, this is, these are two that really describe being unholy, being wicked. 1 Timothy 1, just a couple pages to the left uh, in my Bible, verses, verse 9. Knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for whoremongers. And here's the, the world's the nicest description of homosexuality. For them that defile themselves with mankind, for men stealers, for liars, for perjured persons, and if there be any other thing that's contrary to sound doctrine. Uh, unholy. Just living contrary to, to God. <coughs> Wicked. Then in verse 3 of, of 2 Timothy 3, uh, we're seeing this more, more and more and more without natural affection. I remember, oh, it's been some years ago now, I was teaching on the home, and, and one of the ladies' comment was, well, I think, I think most parents just do the best they can. I said, well, what about those parents who kill their children? Is that the best they can? What about parents who abuse their children? Listen, people don't always do the best they can. None of us always do the best they can, but we've come to a place where, where people will kill their unborn children, and, and now they're using it as a product, fetal material. Folks, this, this is what God says is going to be part of perilous times, fierce times. Let me tell you, it, it should be safe in the womb, but it's not. Without natural affection, truce breakers, that means untrustworthy. People used to say, yeah, my, my word is my bond. You know, we shake hands, that's, that's it. Not anymore. Truce breakers, false accusers. This is an interesting one. The Greek word is actually the word diabolos. I, I used to live in California next to a mountain called Mount Diablo, Devil Mountain. <laughs> uh, the accuser is who, who Satan is. He's a false accuser. The Bible says that's a, a characteristic of the end times. People falsely accusing. Uh, people saying, I, I know why you did that. No, they don't. Uh, nobody knows your heart but God and you. And half the time you don't. False accusers. Then two words, incontinent and fierce. Incontinent means out of control. What well, we see it uh, uh, probably every day in the news, you see of somebody who's been out of control, stabbed somebody, ran over somebody, body slammed somebody because they looked at him funny. Fierce is, is what uh, uh, we're seeing. Not tame, savage, incontinent, fierce. And then he says, despisers of those that are good. This is what brought me into this passage. Uh, Israel Falau just makes a statement uh, to help people. And man, they're fierce about it. Uh, they're, they despise uh, that kind of a statement. Then in verse 4, he says, traitors. The illustration I would use, now this happens in a, in a lot of things, and, and God uses this illustration as well, is marriage. How many people have stood and given witness before God and man and said, I, I vow that I will love you until I die. 
And then a year later, two years later, they say, oh, changed my mind. And God calls that betrayal. Betrayal. You know, as Christians, we should never initiate a divorce. That's another subject. We'll talk about that another time. But God says a characteristic of the last time is traitors, betrayers. A trust that you should be able to give. You, know, you see it in religion where people that are supposedly instructing folks are actually abusing them. You see it in business. You see it all the time. Uh, betrayers. Then he uses a word, heady. That, that means reckless. They have TV shows about people like this. Stupid idiots that are risking life and limb. Uh, High-minded has to do with being proud. Lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. You know, last week we put on a, a little play. Every seat was full. People were out the back door. If, if we had a, a big meal, man, we'd, we'd have a crowd. And, you know, a lot of churches have taken that, that tact. Let's entertain them. Uh, and we'll get the crowds in. Uh, but when you offer people the, the meat of God's word, they're, they're not always there. Uh, we need to be careful. Uh, a characteristic of our day is lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. In verse 5, he says, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. From such turn away. Don't think that the end times will not be religious. Listen, the devil's in the religion business. He loves religion, as long as you're not trusting Christ in the Bible. Right. Oh, the more complicated and, and more fancy, uh, the more he likes it. And as people get into the false teachings of evolution, they get more mystical in their religion. You know, when you turn your brain loose in one area, it goes loose in every area. Man, it just bounces around everywhere. Uh, crystals and pyramids and witchcraft is more popular than ever in a so-called scientific age. Uh, religion uh, is a, a mark of the end times. Then verse 6, he says, For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with diverse lusts. Uh, it's a controlling age. It's a silly age. It's a lustful age. And that's the things that, that he's talking about there. Verse 7, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. They've made learning the end rather than the, the process. Man, we have more education, I think, than we ever had before. And, and the, sorry to use the word, dumber people than ever before. I laugh every time I see the, uh, the license plate. Queensland, the smart state. It's, Western Australia was a state of excitement. We have a theory that whatever is the opposite, that's what they put on the license plate. I don't know. Uh, yeah, we, we live in a dumb world nowadays where people are ever learning but never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. And the truth is so simple. And yeah, we call it the simple plan of salvation, don't we? He's God. I'm not. He's holy. I'm not. He came and died for my sins and offers me forgiveness. And I can take it freely. Man, how much more simple can you get? God knows. <laughs> we can't understand anything too complicated, so he made it simple for us. He took our place. What a wonderful Savior. Uh, don't let these things... Uh, I'm glad we could, could start with this. God put it in this order, and uh, we're taking it in his order. Uh, don't let these things be the character of your life. These are the character of perilous times. These are not people who love the Lord. These are people who love self. It's not where, where we want to be. God decides what's right and wrong. And we need to agree with God. You'll find it'll work out better that way. And as Christians, we need to stand for what's right, no matter what it costs. Listen, it might cost you your job to stand for what's right. I remember our pastor. This must have been 50 years ago. His dad lost his job. He was an accountant with a business, and he wouldn't, you know, the expression, cook the books. And he, wouldn't, he wouldn't cheat. And they'll, they'll find somebody who will. But let me tell you, you'll be better off if, uh, if you'll stand uh, for what's right. Someone has said, silence is golden. Sometimes silence is just downright yellow. Sometimes we need to be the one who speaks up and, and says, I, I'm with the Lord. And that's, that's where we come in in verses 10 and 11. See, we've seen the, the world's way. Now we see Paul's testimony there in 2 Timothy 3, verse 10. He says, But thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience, persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured. 
but out of them all the Lord delivered me. Now we see the Christian. First we saw how the, how the world is, is in the last times. Now we see Paul's testimony, the Christian. And what he says is the first thing. That, that word doctrine has to do with what you teach. And it's based on, the, later on he uses the word faith. Faith is what you believe. And what you believe should decide what you teach, what you say. And what you say in life needs to be based on the word of God. He says, you've known my doctrine. You've known what I've, I've said. Yeah, he wrote it down. He, he was, wasn't making any bones about it. He wasn't trying to be political or something. You've fully known my doctrine. He says, you've fully known my manner of life. That's what you do, what you practice. You know, as Christians, people should be able to count on you to do the Christian thing. Do you remember in, in the book of Daniel? Daniel was a godly man. And there was people who wanted to bring him down. He was, I think he was the prime minister. He was like, was he the second or third? In the, in, anyway, he was, he was very important in the kingdom. And of course, people wanted to bring him down. And the Bible says they couldn't find anything wrong that he would do, but they knew he would do the right thing. So they made a law where doing the right thing was illegal. Well, that sounds just like today, doesn't it? Uh, uh, what we do is, is so important. We need to be like Daniel. Uh, what we teach uh, what we believe uh, is so important. We need to believe the Word of God. And he uses the word there, that he says, you, you've fully known my, my purpose. I find a lot of people, even Christians, don't have a purpose. It, it, their purpose is kind of get through this day. <laughs> it's, it's pretty, uh, pretty non-purposeful. And God wants us to have a purpose. And he says, whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. That needs to be our purpose, to glorify God. Now, I know I say this. I say it regularly. Uh, we even need to brush our teeth to the glory of God. Now, uh, some of you think, what's he talking about? He's just saying everything you do, don't just do it so you don't have rotten teeth. Don't just do it so you don't have bad breath. Do it for the glory of God. It'll, it'll bless the Lord that you're a clean person. You know, comb your hair, clean your house for the glory of God. Drive your car for the glory of God. Not just so you don't get a ticket. Do you see what I'm saying? We need to have a purpose in everything we do. Listen, you may not be able to be a missionary or a pastor or even a Sunday school teacher, but whatever you do, you can do for the glory of God. I'll guarantee you, there's pastors and missionaries who are not doing what they're doing for the glory of God. There's people doing it for money. There's people doing it because their parents made them, <laughs> whatever. We need to do what we do for the glory of God. As Christians, we have a purpose. Uh, we have God's word. We can know the truth, and the, the truth can make us free. Paul wrote in Philippians 1, For to me, to live is Christ. Then he added, And to die is gain. Listen, to die for the Lord. What a blessing. It's like the, the Christian man who got held up at gunpoint. Your money or your life. He said, You can't scare me with heaven. <laughs> I mean, folks, uh, to live is Christ. To die is gain. We need to understand that. What do you believe? What are you saying? What are you living? There should be a contrast between you and those first verses of 2 Timothy chapter 3. You know, those, uh, uh, those people are described as fierce. We need to be described as people of faith. They're described as people who are lovers of self. We need to be described as people who are lovers of God. Lovers of God. And the question is, which side do you want? See, what we've come to now is the conflict. We've seen the world. We've seen the Christian testimony. They're very different. <laughs> they, they don't fit together. You can't compromise and make them work together. There's a conflict. If you're going to choose to follow the Lord, it's going to put you at odds with the world. Uh, let me read the, the next verse. I guess we didn't read verse 12, did we? Look at it. When I was at Bible college one time, we had a preacher. He kept saying, look up at me. Look down at your Bible. Look up at me. <laughs> I won't do that, okay? But do look at verse 12. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. There's a guarantee that a lot of people don't take as their life verse. <laughs> uh, you know, if you live for the Lord, it's going to put you at odds with the world. And we need to understand that. Uh, we were talking in, in Sunday school about uh, how the, the hope that God gives us. There's, there's more than just this life. 
And uh, someday we're going to be with Jesus. Someday we're going to be like Jesus. You know, tears will be passed. That's why we sang some of those songs this morning. Our hope is in the Lord. It's not here. It's there. It's with Him. Now, there's many problems that Christians face because of this difference between God's way and the world's way. And if you're saved, that's going to be a part of your life. In verses 11 and 12, he talks about some of the problems. Uh, he, he personally experienced persecution and affliction. And he was able to name the places. I don't know if you know, but there was people who followed Paul around to persecute him. <laughs> Man, I've never had that happen yet. Uh, at Antioch, Iconium, Lystra, what persecutions I endured. But listen, out of them all, the Lord delivered me. And then he says to them, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. People will attack us when we stand for the Lord. That's just the way it is. Plus, there'll be afflictions. I mean, some of it won't have to do with your stand for the Lord. We just live in a sinful world. But not only are there problems, there's people. Look at verse 13 there. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. He says, people who oppose the Lord are going to get worse and worse. There's been times in history when Christian ideals have been kind of the cultural acceptable. You know, it's, it's been okay to be a Christian. Not anymore. It's not culturally acceptable. I think in our lifetime, it's going to become illegal. And in some places, it already is. It's illegal to, to tell someone it's wrong to be a homosexual. We have to deny the Lord in order to be legal. Well, listen, we ought to obey God rather than men. And we don't tell people things like that to hurt them. You know, the world has become what they call enablers. Do you know what that expression means? An enabler helps someone to do wrong. You know, when we talk to people about their sin, we're not saying, nah, 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 God's going to get you. We want them to be rescued. We want them to be uh, set free from their sin. Listen, a homosexual's problem is not that I tell him that it's wrong. It's that he's a homosexual. And it hurts him or her. It's sin. It's harmful to them. And as Christians, we have mercy on them. You know, God is their judge. We don't have to worry about that. But we were there. It may not have been that sin, but it was, it was sin, guaranteed. And if you've experienced the mercy of the Lord, listen, you want to reach out to people and, and, and rescue them from the burning, like the Bible says. Uh, we need to care about people's souls, and we need to be willing to, to stand for the Lord and, and to say what's right. People should be able to look at us and say, yeah, I know, I know what he teaches. I, I know what, how he lives. I know his purpose. I know his faith. It should be clear to people where we stand uh, when we stand with the Lord. Evil men and seducers. That word seducers literally means wailer. W-A-I-L-E-R. People that are crying all the time. Now, if you've been a parent, you've experienced this. Uh, you know, your little boy or your little girl disobeys, and you go to discipline it, and they start crying. Oh, she's sorry. No, she's not. She's a seducer. <laughs> She's trying to get you not to spank her. <laughs> well, that's what the world does. Oh, they weep and wail and cry about things. Oh, you know, if we say about the homosexuals, they're going to feel bad. Well, they should feel bad and repent and be forgiven and be right with God. Listen, wailing is just sedu seduction, and we need to be careful. Now, we, we've come to the good part, the encouragement. Now, it was good seeing about Paul's testimony, but in verse 14 and following, and he gives us some real encouragement in our Christian lives. Even though we're living in end times and even though we're living in difficult times, uh, there is hope. Let, let me read, first of all, verse 14. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. Let me go ahead and read the whole chapter. That from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. Man, that's encouraging, isn't it? There's some good things there. Now, let me give you four things that, that I see there. Uh, God gives us, gives us hope. Number one, there is deliverance. 
Now, that goes back a little bit to verse 11. Uh, the, he talked about the things he endured, but out of them all, the Lord delivered me. The Lord delivered me. Uh, do you remember Daniel's friends, you know, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Uh, when they didn't bow down to the idol, they said, we're going to throw you in the, in the fiery furnace. And their answer was basically, well, God can deliver us from you. But if he doesn't, that's okay too. Uh, they, were, they were willing to let God deliver them by life or by death. And, and as Christians, we need to understand, it's a difficult world. Uh, there's all kinds of bad things that can happen to us because we're Christians. But there is deliverance. God can deliver us by life or by death. If you look at 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 14, he, he gives us an example, a specific example in his own life. Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. The Lord reward him according to his works. There's a good prayer. There's a good thing to say to somebody. The Lord reward you according to your works. Of whom be thou ware also, for he hath greatly withstood our words. At my first answer, no man stood with me, but all men forsook me. I pray God that it may not be laid to their charge. Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me that by me the preaching might be fully known and that all the Gentiles might hear, and I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. Uh, commentators debate about what that means. I think it just means he was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. Uh, he, he didn't get eaten by a lion. And the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work and will preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom, to whom be glory forever and ever. Man, that's encouraging, isn't it? God will deliver us, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ, to die is gain. Uh, in, uh, in 1 Corinthians, there's a verse that you, you need to know. He says, There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above the year able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape, that you may be able to bear it. That's talking particularly about temptation. But in life in general, God will deliver us by life or by death. That's 1 Corinthians 10, 13. So number one, there is deliverance. That gives us hope. Number two, you can be right with God even in a wicked world. Now, we see that all the time in Scripture. Uh, right here in, in these verses 14 to 17, uh, Paul is writing to a young Christian pastor who had a Christian mother and a Christian grandmother. They lived in a wicked world, and they lived for the Lord. Paul lived for the Lord. Timothy lived for the Lord. Uh, we can live for the Lord in a wicked world. The, the Old Testament example that comes to my mind is Noah. You know, when Jesus talks about the end times, he says, well, let me, let me show it to you. Matthew 24 and uh, verse 37. Matthew 24, verse 37. He says, but as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. He said, the wickedness that was going on in Noah's day, he said, it's going to be like that. Now, Noah lived for the Lord in a wicked world, didn't he? Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. So can we. He goes on. Jesus is telling them, for as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark. He's saying they were just doing normal things. And knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Then shall two be in the field, the one shall be taken, the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill, the one shall be taken, the other left. Watch therefore, for you know not what hour your Lord doth come. God says we need to be living for Him. And we can. We can live for the Lord, even though it's a wicked world. Number three, God's Holy Spirit is still working. Listen, God has promised us that he'll never leave us or forsake us. And when you get saved, God's Holy Spirit takes up residence in you. That's an amazing thought. It's a strange thought. But there in, in the 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, he talks about the inspiration of God, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit gave us God's word. Well, that same Holy Spirit is still working today. God's Holy Spirit uh, is still uh, working in your life, in my life, and, and can work in the lives of others. In fact, in 2 Thessalonians 2.7, it's kind of a strange verse. 
Uh, but he says in 2 Thessalonians 2, 7, the mystery of iniquity doth already work. And he's saying sinful times are already starting. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. That's what I'm saying. It's kind of a strange verse. Is that, that word let in those days meant restrain. He who is restraining will keep restraining and, until he steps out of, the, out of the way. And it's talking about the Holy Spirit. Listen, if God's Holy Spirit weren't active in our world today, it would be a lot worse. <laughs> and God's Holy Spirit, if you're saved, is working in your heart. He's helping you. He's encouraging you. He's blessing you. Helping you to understand Scripture. And through you and the Word of God, God's Holy Spirit can, I almost use the word afflict, <laughs> can afflict people. You know, he, can, he can attack their heart and bring them to the knowledge of the truth. God's Holy Spirit is still working. The same Holy Spirit that was working in Paul's day is working in our day, and he hasn't changed. So, there is deliverance. You can be right with God. God's Holy Spirit is still working. God's Holy Spirit is available in Stafford, <laughs> all right, or wherever you live. Uh, and fourthly, we can be salt and light. This is pretty similar to you can be right with God, but you know, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5 that we're the... We're the salt of the earth. We're the light of the world. That's an amazing thing, isn't it? He said, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Uh, we're to be salt. We're to be light. Salt is not like everything else. It flavors. It preserves. We're to be different. We're to be salt. In fact, he said, if the salt loses its savor, what's it good for? You know, if we're not different, what are, we, what are we doing here? He says we're light. Light is a strange thing. If you've ever been in the dark and somebody turned on the light, you know, what you normally say is, turn out that light. <laughs> and, you know, when, when you're light in a dark world, uh, it exposes things. But you know what? It also helps people. You've had it happen where somebody gets a torch and, and they help you to find your way. Uh, that's, that's what we want to do. And it makes sense. The darker the world, the easier it is to be a light. <laughs> really. You know, the more we'll contrast to those around us. Don't be afraid of that. Shine for Jesus. So there's some encouragement, isn't there? Uh, we're living in a wicked world. Don't focus on that. Don't make that your, your life. Focus on Jesus. Focus on the good things, the encouragement uh, that God is doing something good in you and through you. I want you to turn to one other passage. Uh, it's 1 Peter chapter 3. These are some of the verses we've been going through on Sunday nights. And just quickly, I want to show you some things that he says we can do that will help us. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse, verse 14. 1 Peter 3, 14 says, But, and if ye suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye, and be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. One of the things that I would encourage you to do as you experience difficulty as a Christian, number one is don't be afraid. Don't give in to fear. God says in 1 Timothy, uh, 1 Timothy 1, God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And by the way, don't be ashamed either. You don't need to be ashamed to stand for the Lord. Uh, don't be afraid. Verse 15, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. Here's something else you can do. Reverence the Lord. Make the Lord at home in your heart. Uh, know the Lord. Sanctify the Lord in your heart. And then be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that's in you with meekness and fear. Make sure you have that hope. Uh, but be ready. Know what you believe. Know how to say it. Practice it. You know, practice with each other. Uh, God's word will help you. He says all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's God's Word, and it's profitable for doctrine, you know, what you say, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect. That means complete, truly furnished unto all good works. So don't be afraid. Sanctify the Lord in your heart. Be ready. And then verse 16, having a good conscience, that whereas they speak evil of you as evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. Have a good conscience. If you've done wrong, admit it and get rid of it. Now, do right. 
Be right with God, be right with man. Have a good conscience. What God is saying here is take the eternal view. Uh, there's a lot of things going on around us. Don't let that distract you from the, the things of eternity. And my question would be to you this morning is, if you died today, if you died, you know for sure, based on the Bible, that you'd go to heaven. Are you saved? Now, when Paul wrote these words to Timothy there in 2 Timothy, he knew that the same Bible that Timothy had read, his mother had read. And it still showed the way of salvation. The same words of God. And they were saved through faith in Jesus Christ. That's why he was able to say, him, say to him that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Now, you know, the Bible is still true today. The Bible is still the same today. The Bible still changes lives today. And as I was thinking about it this morning, I thought, really, this chapter leads us then to chapter 4. You know, because we have this hope and because we have this, uh, uh, this blessings of the Lord, look at chapter 4, verse 1. Here's what we're supposed to do. I charge thee, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. Be instant, in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. See, that's what we're supposed to do. Stand on the word of God. Make it known. For the time will come when they will not endure a sound doctrine. But after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou. I'm going to talk about that tonight. I encourage you to, to be here for that, for that message. Uh, have you trusted the Christ of the Bible? Have you trusted Jesus Christ? Uh, the only way we know the truth about God is through the Scripture. God has revealed it to us. You know, God has said we've all, we're all sinners. All of sin. He says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. God offers us salvation. Sin is a problem. Now, the world we live in is a problem, but God has a solution. He is the solution. In fact, Jesus said, uh, the Bible says in John 1, as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Again, I would ask, are you saved? Are you saved? If you are saved, keep trusting the Lord. Uh, Jesus is coming again. If you're not saved, trust him today. Be born again. Uh, that's God's purpose, that you know him and be in fellowship with him. Uh, we live in a wicked world, but greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. Aren't you glad? Uh, let's go to him in prayer, and then we're going to close with a song. Father, we are grateful for your word. Lord, it can be so confusing sometimes as we... Uh, look at the standards of, of our society and culture. and uh, Lord, help us to look to you for what's right and wrong. Help us to live for you. Lord, save our families. Help us to, uh, to live uh, godly lives in our homes and at work and at school. Uh, Lord, help us. I, I pray that your Holy Spirit would, would work in our midst even today. And if there are those that are not saved, Father, that they would turn from their sin and turn to you. That they'd quit loving themselves and love you. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.